Good afternoon. I'm Diana Waring. I'm the director of the Department of the Interior Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the latest installment of our public lecture series. As many of you know, these presentations tend to encompass a wide range of topics to reflect the diverse workings of our bureaus and the Department of the Interior as a whole, both past and present. Today's program is a discussion on Alaskan ivory carving. And before we get started, I want to point out that all of you should have feedback forms on your, your seats. I encourage you to fill these out and deposit them in the tray that's outside. Uh, in terms of, of how this helps us, we, we really greatly appreciate any feedback that you have regarding um, programs that you'd like to learn more about uh, or programs that maybe you yourself are involved in or your colleagues that you think uh, the general public as well as the Department of the Interior audience might be interested in. Before we get started, I do want to also say that we have some uh, wonderful programs coming up. We are going to be taking a brief pause in January, but then starting back up February 5th, with Sarah Newman from the National Park Service. She's going to be discussing the very interesting and very long-term relationship that the Interior has had with the Public Health Service. But bringing our attention to today's presenters, I'm so pleased to be welcoming our very special guest, Ben Pungawi, and our colleagues from the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, an agency in the Department of the Interior that works on public programs supporting the economic development of native artisans and law enforcement activities aimed at combating counterfeit and misrepresented native art. Our special guest, Ben Pugawi, is a master St. Lawrence Island Yupik carver from Savunga, Alaska. He'll be speaking on his journey to becoming a carver and how passing on his knowledge to future generations and some of the difficulties of Alaskan native ivory carvers facing today. We're also joined by Arts and Crafts Board, uh, Dr. Lars Krutak and Ken Van Way, who are both program specialists in the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lars Krutak and our other speakers. Uh, thank you for the opening comments. Um, well, it's amazing to be here today to speak about St. Lawrence Island because uh, actually that's where I conducted my master's thesis research, gosh, 20 something plus years ago. Um, and over the last two decades, I've been fortunate enough to work on different other projects involving St. Lawrence Island from repatriation um, to the population history source book of St. Lawrence Island, which was a National Science Foundation project with the Arctic Studies Center uh, that was some time ago. Um, but with that aside, um, I'm basically going to sort of just provide a general overview of sort of the geography, um, some of the cultural history of the island, and then turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ken Van Way, who will speak a little bit more about the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Um, so I better get started here. So St. Lawrence Island, it's right here. I'm going to here St. Lawrence Island. I think everybody can see that now All right, perfectly. It's the largest island in Bering Sea, and it sits in frigid Arctic waters some 120 miles from mainland Alaska and only 38 miles from mainland Siberia. It is approximately 120 uh, miles long and averages 20 to 30 miles in width. And it has been continuously inhabited for over 2,000 years, although a severe famine in the winter of 1878 and 79 nearly decimated the entire population. It actually wiped out pretty much the eastern side of the island and the remaining survivors congregated in Gamble. The St. Lawrence Islanders rely heavily on sea mammals for their livelihood and material culture. St. Lawrence Island lies amidst the migration routes of the Pacific walrus, which we're going to be speaking about a lot today. Several species of whale, including bowhead, finback, minke, gray or summer whale, in addition to spotted seal, ringed seal, and the bearded seal. These sea mammals have been part of the traditional diet supplemented with flora and fauna, especially fish. For thousands of years, St. Lawrence Islanders carved, carvers utilized Pacific walrus ivory to produce a large variety of tools to help them survive the difficult and often hostile environment. Ancient seafaring peoples obtained walrus ivory from the tusks or large canine teeth of the animal. The very earliest ivory implements were purely functional and typically undecorated. 
And around 200, uh, 200 BC, however, people of the prehistoric Old Bering Sea culture began producing more ornate pieces of carved ivory from dolls, um, more ornamented toggling harpoon pieces, unlike that one, um, harpoon counterweights, uh, which there's an example here in slide D, which actually went on the back of a harpoon head to help sort of counterbalance it as a counterweight so it would fly through the air and hit its target. Snow goggles and even um, amazingly decorated ulus or cutting tools. Um, and some of these dolls, uh, which I'm showing, some of them they're headless, some of them remain intact. Um, you, you can tell a lot about these, the persons um, based on their facial tattooing, and we can actually sex some of these. This is actually um, a, a great whaling captain, and we know that because he has a visor, a whaling visor on his head, and then he has a series of uh, tattoo tally marks on his, on his uh, cheek. Living on the islands and headlands of Bering Strait, uh, these peoples used bow drills and stone burins to create these animated surface decorations. And over time, uh, subsequent peoples, prehistoric peoples like the Punic, who subsumed the old Bering Sea people, um, and we believe also intermarried with them, employed metal scribing tools and compasses to create precise circles and dot motifs on the ivory itself. Decorated tools serve practical functions. If objects were embellished, it was to help please or satisfy the spirits of game animals and other unseen forces that were believed to control local environments because they were attracted by beautiful things. Since ancient times, ornamented objects like these helped guarantee human survival in a sometimes unforgiving Arctic landscape. In the mid-1800s, excuse me, many prehistoric ivory artifacts, which originated from ancient village sites around Bering Strait, appeared in the hands of Alaska Native collectors. Over time, Alaska Natives exchanged these objects with American whalers and ship captains, teachers, missionaries, and traders for, monies and good, for money and goods. Eventually, these individuals passed them on to museum curators who considered them as works of art fit for museum displays. Although sales and exchanges of fossil ivory objects became a regular part of Alaska Native commerce by the early 20th century, the arrival of American whalers in 1848 transformed local artistic traditions of ivory carving. Seafaring men desired mementos of their travels to take home, and they purchased artifacts and commissioned new objects of walrus ivory from local carvers, including parasol handles, pipes, canes, napkin rings, salt and pepper shakers, and other objects. Whalers also introduced scrimshawing techniques, um, and as well as engraving techniques. This resulted in the development of cribbage boards and a new pictorial style emerged where modeled human and animal figures appeared more lifelike than before. During this period of artistic transformation, local Alaska Native carvers also began signing their works for the first time. Traditionally, Alaska Native carvers produced various species of, an oh, sorry, produced various species of animals for toys, game pieces, and amulets. In the mid-20th century, carvings of birds and other animals became increasingly popular among collectors. As the marketplace expanded in the 1970s, scenes of everyday life began to appear. Dog teams, hunting and underwater scenes, and people engaged in various activities became more common. St stands of bone, baleen, and wood helped support these complex compositions. In the 1990s, ancient artifacts excavated from the soil or studied in museum collections inspired some carvers to recreate or integrate them into contemporary works. Prehistoric objects evoked powerful mythological and ancestral connections, and carvers employed these themes to communicate their sense of place and cultural identity. Walrus tusk is the primary natural material used by Alaska natives for ivory carving. The Yupik people of St. Lawrence Island classify walrus ivory into three general categories, new, beached, and old. New ivory comes from recently hunted walruses. Walrus tusks found buried in beach sand, the sea bottom or terrestrial soil is called beached ivory, like the example on this table, which is from a baby walrus that's been in the soil for probably hundreds of years. This ivory type may display varying degrees of coloration, Sometimes it's brown, sometimes it's gray, sometimes it even has a bluish tint or it's reddish brown, depending on the tannins and the minerals from the surrounding substrate that surrounds it. 
Old ivory refers to artifacts repurposed for new carvings. Some artists prefer to carve new ivory obtained from female walruses. Males often fight one another and their tusks become broken or display deep cracks. Female tusks are more slender and less bulky than male tusks and are not as prone to cracking. Whale bone and whale baleen, which are hair-like bristles made of keratin found in a whale's mouth, are utilized by Alaska natives in their carving. Whale bone is typically aged for years or even decades before it's being used due to the strong odor when it is fresh. Both bone and baleen are often incorporated as a secondary material in carvings made of walrus ivory, although they are occasionally used by themselves. Ribs, discs, and whale vertebrae are commonly used in carvings of shaman figures, owls, and walrus. Baleen is used in polished form as an inlay material for eyes and ivory carvings, usually. It is primarily it is a primary material used in carvings of whale boats, for example, orcas and loons and other birds. Today, Alaska native ivory carvers produce incredibly diverse works, and some of the popular themes include animals, walrus and various species of seals, whales and birds are perhaps the most common carving subjects today. They sometimes sit on supporting stands created from natural materials like whalebone, baleen, or ivory. Hunting wildlife and human activity scenes. Many contemporary Alaska native carvers actually hunt throughout the year and perform traditional dances and drum at community events. These activities often inspire the dynamic and lively forms that they create today. Human animal transformation scenes. Transformation scenes are characteristic of prehistoric ivory objects from the Bering Strait region. Although traditional religious practices largely died out here in the early 20th century with the arrival of missionaries, carved scenes of shamans transforming into animals began appearing in the early 1990s. Inspired by the ancient artists who came before them, contemporary ivory carvers communicate a shared sense of local community identity through these powerful works. Ancient artifacts are human figurine replicas. Carvers pay homage to the past through works inspired by ancient ivory artifacts or human doll forms. Artists often use beached or old ivory to create these dramatic works. St. Lawrence Island Yupik carver Susie Saluk, who is from Gamble Village, explains her connectedness to these prehistoric carvings. She says, we have at least 2,000 years of continuous settlement in Gamble. So these objects provide an indication of the ancientness of my culture. I think about the person who made them and the astounding workmanship that went into those pieces. They were superb artists, the symmetry, the lines. It's a real communication of culture and intelligence and elegance and beauty. You couldn't ask for better predecessors. I am still trying to equal them. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ken. So under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, Pacific walruses are, are part of that and they can only be harvested following 1972 uh, when the act was enacted. Pacific walrus can only be harvested by coastal dwelling Alaska natives and the ivory harvested from those walruses can only be sold or transferred if it has been significantly transformed from its natural form through Alaska native craft work. But once an Alaska native has carved and sold that ivory, anyone can resell that work. So <clears throat> the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, which is our agency, works to uh, enforce the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, which is a truth and marketing law for the sale of American Indian and Alaska native. Uh, under the act, if something is being offered as Indian, Native American, Alaska Native, it's an art and craft work, it has to be made by an Indian or Alaska Native as defined by the act, which would be an enrolled member of a federally recognized Indian tribe, an enrolled member of a state recognized Indian tribe, an enrolled member of an Alaska Native tribe or village, or a member or a shareholder, rather, of an Alaska Native corporation. And there's also a provision under the act that allows an Indian tribe to certify somebody who is descended from that tribe as a non-member Indian artisan. But that has to be done by, by the tribe itself. 
There have been some cases involving the Indian Arts and Crafts Act in Alaska that, that involve these things. Uh, <clears throat> there's also quite often in Alaska uh, an overlap between Indian Arts and Crafts Act cases and Marine Mammal Protection Act cases. And the board works very closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration on, on some of these cases. So the, the first major case we had was in uh, 2012. A gentleman named Edward Schlieff was sentenced to three years of probation and fined $7,500 in the District of Alaska. He was selling seal skin bow hunting tabs through magazine ads and through sporting goods stores. Uh, and he was offering those as being made by Alaska natives when they were in fact not being made by Alaska natives. So he was both violating the Indian Arts and Crafts Act by selling the, the craft product as Alaska native made, but also uh, had been using the seal skin in violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. There were several cases in 2016 uh, were investigations performed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service involving uh, Karandang, Sippy, and Karim, who all had retail establishments in southeastern Alaska. They were selling bone and ivory carvings through their shops as Alaska Native made, but they weren't. Uh, undercover, op undercover agents interviewed people, made buys, and eventually each of these store owners pleaded guilty to selling this non-Alaska Native made art and craft work as Alaska Native made. Uh, they were sentenced to probation, they were fined, and they were ordered to write apologies that were published in local newspapers. The most recent case, which has all been unfolding in 2019, uh, <clears throat> also investigated by the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, John Lee Skrenick, who owned a gallery in Anchorage, had been selling work that he himself had created uh, using ivory, the walrus ivory, uh, as Alaska Native made. Mr. Skrenick is not an Alaska Native. So all of the, the work he is, was selling had been in, sold in violation of both the Indian Arts and Crafts Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. He has pleaded guilty at this point to one, char one count of each of those charges, but hasn't been sentenced, so I don't have that much more information about it. But that is ongoing and we're very enthused about it. What can consumers do? If you're interested after this lecture in bringing home some of some Alaska native ivory for yourself, buying from a dealer who's got a fairly good reputation is always a good start or maybe from an artist. So you, when you're looking to buy a piece, you're going to want to familiar, familiarize yourself with the art form, familiarize yourself with the materials and just sort of have a general sense of what it is that you're looking at so that when you are going to, to make a purchase in a shop, you can make reasonable assessments uh, about what you're looking at. Uh, understand, something like this takes a lot of time, a lot of workmanship, requires specialized materials, so a piece can be fairly expensive, and if something really seems to be too good a deal, it, it probably is. <laughs> And from an enforcement perspective, we strongly recommend that people get things in writing. Rather than ending up in a, a he said, she said sort of situation, if you have documentation of your purchase, a receipt, guarantees from whoever is selling the item about what it is made of, who the artist is, what the tribal affiliation of that artist is, um, at the very minimum, you should be spending the same time and getting the same documentation for a high-end piece of art that you would be spending to get a toaster. That you would have all that documentation to buy something for your home at under $100. There's no reason to throw that sort of, of caution away when you're buying something uh, at a much more expensive end of the market. Another thing to look for is the Alaska Silver Hand Seal. 
Uh, Alaska State Council on the Arts administers the program. It certifies that native handicraft is made by Alaska natives. Uh, there is also a symbol with a bear on it that just indicates that something is Alaska made, but does not indicate that it is Alaska native made. So it is important to make that distinction as well. That there is a criminal penalty for the misuse of the seal. So if they're, but you're buying something with the seal and it turns out to be a problem, the Alaska state government has an interest in pursuing things as well as the board. The State Council on the Arts was shut down temporarily with the Alaska budget crisis, but it is my understanding that the Silver Hand program will be back in operation next month. Is it good morning or good afternoon? <laughs> Hi, I am Ben Pungawi. I was born and raised in Subunga, Alaska, from an island called St. Lawrence. We, I wanted to elaborate um, a little bit more about the island. It's, uh, it's like a quick stop uh, for the migratory path of the uh, marine mammals going up north with the ice and then coming back down. So the weak and the dying in, end up on the shores of the island. This is where most of the ivory comes from. In fact, 85% of the fossil ivory comes from St. Lawrence Island. I was raised by my grandparents as the first, first born back in 1958. And that was the year before uh, Alaska became part of the Union. Up until six, well, I was nine, I wa observed my grandfather producing these little figurines out of ivory, which in turn, he goes down to the local um, grocery store to trade. And I think that's what you call bartering. So when he sits down hours, I would sit down, he would tell me to, as long as you're quiet and watch me carve. So I used to sit there and just watch these little figurines transform into little seals, walruses, polar bears, and birds. Mainly the, the animals that kind of revolve around the island during the breakup season into the fall and they start migrating back down south to the Aleutian chain. So after three years of um, observing him, he threw me a, a piece of walrus tooth and said, here, go for it. So I sat there on the bench and clasped that little walrus tooth. and. Uh, he, he left me a small piece that's, that was a seal. So I used um, a file which, which she uses to rough cut a small piece like a walrus tooth. It took time, time, and time, and he said, don't worry. It takes time to learn to carve, you know, it, this hard piece of material that I'm working with turned into what I think I thought would be a seal in about a week. I would set it aside and forget about it for the hours the rest of the day and come back to it when he's, when he's finally done finishing up with his work. So over the years, um, over the years there's a program at the school where a local, locally uh, expert locally recognized to teach carving class. I've known my older, well, my, my biological father as my older brother. So he was part of the program. So I learned uh, some techniques from him along with the other students in my age group. And um, after carving within the community, we the cousins and uncles and grandfathers uh, have visitations to exchange ideas and techniques of carving that build up my 
um, help build up my carving, um, what you call it, um, intricacy. But when I do hunt with uh, with my um, my father's crew, when we do get a walrus, I focused on the walrus to represent the material it came from. When when I butcher a walrus, I pay closely attention to the details, uh, the facial expression. Every you know, the walruses have their um, own character. And every piece I produce of a walrus, I try to put a uh, character in what I visualized out there while during the hunt. Today we are challenged with a lot more um, intense uh, challenge like uh, change in weather patterns uh, known as um, global change, uh, the global warming or climate change. We are experiencing a lot more of the um, low pressure systems they call, they come up from the southeast and we have more storms than normal. And uh, our hunting goes um, in pattern with uh, the weather system, you know, when it's safe enough to get out there, we get small craft advisory. We don't have any boats that are any bigger than 20 foot length, small aluminum crafts. Back in the 70s, the, I believe the 80s was the last time we used a skin boat. And that skin boat had a lot of capacity to bring home a lot more of the catch from the animal and it's safe. We felt safe with it. But today in modern, um, more of a modern craft, we have aluminum crafts that are motored with a larger horsepower outboards. And we are faced with a lot more cost of fueling and supplying ammunition and uh, some survival gear to get out there. And this, the arts and crafts uh, does um, supplement that activity largely because when you get out to the rural community, the only kind of jobs you see out there are seasonal jobs and that's that would take only about 20% of the population that is qualified to be a part of that seasonal job. I think there's like almost a, li a little over 1% that are full year-round jobs like the postal service, the airline agents, and most of the community there uh, do not have jobs and we heavily rely on subsistence act activity to supplement our yearly survival. And uh, those are some of the challenges and diff difficulties that we're facing right now. And uh, if he, he, he was, he mentioned something about the, the tools, um, ivory being our tool of survival from thousands of years ago, the oldest culture that uh, from the island known is uh, the Akvik era, the the Ukvik era we call it. It days it goes back to three thousand years, and most of the implements that I've seen are the harpoon heads and um, arrowheads, uh, the bolas made out of walrus teeth. Uh, therefore hunting birds and uh, some of the fishing hooks with separate barbs are made out of ivory also. And those things I focus on, um, most of the figurines, I, uh, the ones that I focus on are the human figurines because it represents that era as far back as my culture. In, in, in to, for me to introduce my culture. So those are the impacts that 
that are facing us today, uh, the ivory ban and um, the weather patterns, which is making it a little bit more difficult for our community as we are a subsistence community that we rely on heavily, heavily to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, Thank you. Ken, and Lars. We'll go into questions and answers. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll come to you with the microphone. Uh, why did you quit using skin boats? Why did you quit using skin boats? Is uh, that uh, the harvest has gone down due to the weather patterns and we have to work out there in order to get the um, the height of the walrus in the time frame is so short because the weather is so unpredictable and we're start we started relying on the, the modern um, boat even though if it costs something you know uh, we don't have any much time to be uh, cutting up a, a hide out there and that's one of the reasons the skin boats don't exist anymore we really have to work fast out there there are um, I guess various sources of ivory in the world the ivory from the elephant tusk and of course the the walrus ivory from Alaska are there other types of ivory in the world? And what uh, challenges do consumers face in the purchasing and use of the various ivories? Or maybe I could ask an, e an easier question. Uh, what, how do different types of ivory look? Would I know an elephant ivory from a walrus ivory? That may be a silly question. I, I just don't know. Oh, OK. Um. The elephant ivory, I believe, has more of a solid um, to the core, uh, one dense material. But walrus ivory has a core, and it has an enamel, which is uh, the quality, quality part of the ivory. And uh, what's rare on the island is a narwhal tusk. But I think it's further up north in the northern Canadian area, Greenland or Iceland. I'll just add something. Um, we do have an Alaska Native ivory brochure that's, when you walk in the door, you'll see it there. There's actually a side-by-side -side comparison of an elephant tusk and a walrus ivory tusk, so it shows you what a core sample looks like, a cross-section, sorry. So you could, there's a quite a distinctive difference but then again, if you don't have uh, a cross-section available to you, then it's hard to see the difference. <laughs> so you need to saw through one to see it. But there is an obvious difference to identify. that. Um, there's also mammoth and mastodon ivory across Alaska, but I'm unsure of it actually um, being found on St. Lawrence Island. I actually have no idea if, if it, there are localities, but I'm curious to know. Do you, do you come across it there? Or I know in other parts of the mainland, yes, but I, I, I'm not, I don't know. I do believe there was a land bridge at one point because we do, my cousin found a whole skull with uh, a whole seven or eight foot long uh, tusk of a Macedon, I, I believe it. And it was all blue. So it must have gone back 10, 11,000 years ago. And uh, yeah. And what did you do with it? <laughs> well, he. Research the market, and uh, I guess one of the people that was interested in it came to the island and purchased from him. He back then he didn't know the value of uh, a whole skull or a tusk of a mastodon. Every now and then, uh, people find smaller pieces, you know, like. Um, not even a couple of three feet in length, but it's just a fragment of a mastodon. So I, I wanted to 
thank you for coming all the way from St. Lawrence uh, to Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. It's quite a, uh, a long journey for you, but we really appreciate your coming. And I have a question. Of all the figures that you carve out of ivory, what is your favorite one to carve, and what goes through your heart and mind when you carve it? A walrus figurine is my favorite because I literally had dependent on um, surviving with this mammal that I've consumed and uh, where the material came from. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you get your the things you make to market? How you sell them? What's the route? How do you get things to market? How do you get them to your customers? How do we get to next to, to your customers? Oh, okay. There are local gift shops. Uh, Nome is known as one of the hubs for native arts and crafts, namely the ivory. Now it's just a mixture of bone, fossil bone carvings. And they do have a website. And everyone has a website now through <laughs> thanks to the technology of communicating all throughout the world. And follow up on that, uh, Ken, uh, this is a softball question, I promise. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned how people know what they're, what's, what's authentic and, and what, where to, what, the, what to look for. You want to say a word about the source directory in that context? Sure. Uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board does have an online source directory of American Indian and Alaska Native owned and operated arts and crafts businesses. Uh, <clears throat> it's set up by the location of the business and not necessarily the location of the tribe. So we do have some Alaska Native artists in Alaska as well as some um, in Very, yeah, in Washington State and elsewhere in the United States. And then also in, in our Alaska section, we do have sev several uh, artisans from the lower 48. Um, so just a quick question. I noticed in a lot of the photographs, as well as in some of the anecdotes, that it seems that uh, ivory carving is primarily a uh, Male craft is that uh, a correct assumption, or are there female artisans also carving ivory? It is ivory carving mostly a, a male craft, or are there there women who are crafting with, with the ivory too? It's um, well, ladies. Some of the ladies have acquired craftsmanship when. Most of the their husbands are out hunting, and uh, it is helping this supplement within the family. You know, there's uh, things like bills to pay for the housing, for the fuel to heat up, and electricity, utilities. So they they have acquired. they I'd say they're quite accomplished artists. I'd just like to add, there's a book that uh, was published about five years ago of the, um, the Carvers of Savunga, St. Lawrence Island, and there's several biographies of women um, in that particular book, so it's something you might be interested in looking at. Um, but yeah, those are very accomplished um, younger carvers who are coming up, as well as ones that are older that have that been carving for a long, long, long time. Oh, oh, the cover of the book? Oh, yeah. And, uh, Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, well, yeah, of course. I was going to, I think there's two covers, but the cover of that book actually is one of Ben's pieces uh, of a walrus because, you know, he's, he's amazing walrus figures. And then, of course, perhaps maybe one of the most famous carvers from St. Lawrence Island is your aunt, right? Or cousin? Cousin. Cousin. It's Susie Saluk, whose pieces, one of her pieces, exquisite pieces, um, is on the cover of her Alaska Native Ivory brochure, and she's from Gamble. Um, I don't know if she, she recently moved back to the island because she was in Washington State for quite... I think she... Anchorage, she's in Anchorage, sorry. Um, but her carvings are incredible. She was a former um, artist fellow at the National Museum of American Indian. Um, she does a lot of work with the Arctic Studies Center and the Anchorage Museum, and um, her, her carvings are collected worldwide. I mean, she's top tier, obviously. 
Mr. Pengawi, can you talk a little bit about changes in the tools that you've used over your lifetime, like compare them to what your grandfather <gasps> did? Or for example, can you talk about when um, electrical tools started to be used for carving? Sure. Um, prior to the 80s, we used tr traditional tools, which are basically just a hacksaw, a vise. Um, a coping saw is one that curves, cuts, rough cuts the uh, ivory, and there are a series of um, courses of um, files they use. And um, as far as sandpaper, yeah, we work from medium to fine to finish off the uh, the, sh the polish to polish the ivory and then when the tools motorized tools came in the 80s it it helped us get more of the detail um, show a little more intricate pieces like um, hard to reach pieces you know, in corners and uh, the facial expression of the animals. Thank you. There are a couple islands off the east end of St. Lawrence that are called the graveyard of the Arctic, and I don't think any people live on those little islands, but do you still scavenge uh, bones and whale bones and, and material to carve from those little islands? Those little islands are uh, called Punuk Islands. And that, are they underwater now with climate change? Well, over the centuries, when my well, when my cousin first uh, dove for some beach ivory, you know, and uh, he was well off, maybe 150 yards off the shore, he said, you. You know, there's some dwellings down there. You know, I can find artifacts in when in the water in the, under under the water because uh, the water's rising. Yeah, over the centuries, and now um, the the sea is more exposed, and it's causing some more erosion around the island. And those islands still do exist, and uh, they're like a a small sanctuary or kind of like a graveyard for the weak and dying. That's where most of the ivory comes from. Oh, okay. This question is for one of the other two of you. I don't know which one, but are we considering having a system like Canada has where you, when you buy an artifact from the native uh, people there, there's a little seal underneath with a number on it, and you can go home on your computer and, and type in that number, and you're registered in Canada on the internet as owning that piece. Is there any effort here to do anything like that? It would help, one of the reasons for me is it would help the customs people to maybe be more uh, confident to let us pass the trade, the, the craft through, because it's hard for them to know whether it's elephant or fraudulent from someone who isn't a native. But if we had a system that uh, was well documented, as in Canada, then it would help the customs people, I think, to help the natives to sell their craft. Is there any look at that? At this time, I'm not aware of, of any plan like that or any proposal like that. When I was in Banff, I bought my first things in the middle 90s. And all three of them were from Canada, of course, and had the seal. And I became very familiar with that and was surprised when I started getting things from Alaska that there wasn't a system like that. Okay, right, yeah. So Alaska State, as I, I pointed out earlier, does have their own system with the, the Silver Hand program, but that doesn't centrally track the items. It only tracks who is allowed to use those seals. I believe yeah. that they do have numbers that are, are trackable to, to the artists, perhaps, but 
and that's not also, to the item. And that's so. also a program that you have to buy into more or less as an artist, like you have to register for it. It's not, a, I don't think it's a, a big fee, but still to to get uh, you know s supply of the, the the tags to put onto your um, I would just art encourage copies. us yeah as a government I used to work for the government um, to um, think about a system that would make it easier for the customs officers because I think they're a choke point mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. not knowing whether something's real or not legitimate and it's so I mean and the counterfeiting is so good to this day, it's it's very difficult to tell what is real and what's not. So the resins and um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult challenge. That's for sure we face every day. So. On that very note, Lars, um, I'm interested in knowing how much uh, of these ivory carvings are counterfeited. Do we have any idea uh, how much and from what countries? I don't think that we, I mean, we know what countries, I think, um, I mean, to some degree, but I don't think we have an idea of the volume. I mean, there really aren't any reliable statistics on how big uh, the counterfeiting problem um, encompasses Native American arts and crafts, although some figures may put it at 70 to 80 percent of all Native American arts that are on the market are counterfeit. Um, but again, um, there aren't a lot of reliable statistics. Um, because we don't have a lot of accurate statistics to detail how many sales there are, because um, obviously not everybody's reporting their sales. <laughs> criminals <laughs> definitely. Yeah, and criminals, yeah, and yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and then Ken. Oh yeah, so yeah, there is a GAO uh, did a report in 2010, and I think their their general conclusion was that it would be too difficult to even undertake a, a study to figure that out for precisely these reasons, that getting artists to self-report. Uh, being able to determine because criminals don't self-report what the relative percentages are that there are just a variety of difficulties in coming up with, with particular statistics I am curious uh, Ben do you do you have any experience uh, with seeing counterfeits in the wild or uh, I've heard a, a few that have gone down to like Indonesia but this is uh, from the the fossilized ivory so it, it, that person did get caught that's how close we work together with uh, the law enforcement of the wildlife you know they, their quick reaction come within a couple of hours to a couple of days so we work really closely and collab collaborate and how the operation goes out there on the subsistence program and uh, I've heard of um, Indonesian that was uh, art was produced and brought back to Alaska that was trying to be sold as na authentic native art, but that person was caught right away. And, and oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm just going to say, oh, I was I was going to talk about that. I'm just going to say because you asked about specific countries that are sources of issues. China is one, and of course Indonesia is another. Um, but if you oh, want yeah. to add. and we we have recently. So the Indian Arts and Crafts Board has an enforcement agreement that we've worked out with the Fish and Wildlife Service, following the 2010 amendments to the Act that allow any federal law enforcement officer to investigate an Act case. And they're actually, Fish and Wildlife Service is bringing in a new agent in Anchorage to specifically address Indian Arts and Crafts Act cases. So we, we expect a, a lot more action in the future. Thanks. Um, so erosion was mentioned and along kind of the line of uh, fakes and counterfeits, I'm wondering if looting of, of graves, if there were artifacts that were buried um, with people on the island in the past, if that's been an issue that you've seen at all or that's come up on the island? Yeah, the erosion are exposing some of those old dwellings from um, from the old era, like the Ukwik era. There are layers. The, the further you go down, maybe about 12 feet under uh, the Ukvik era and on top of that old Bering Sea and there's uh, Punuk and then there's Thule. 
So those are being ex exposed. Um, water is a powerful thing, you know, it eats away on land. So they're being exposed to. But are they protected? Have you seen or well, has been an issue? They're not really protected at this time. With this climate change yeah. is impending. But then again, St. Lawrence sounds pretty remote. So I mean, to get there, uh, it's it's ext it's difficult. It's very expensive to get there, um, and there are not any helicopter tours that I know of. You could land in one of these sites mm -hmm. and go digging. Um, and typically, if you show up at the airport as you know, not somebody who's local, um, you're usually. I mean, I have in the past when I first arrived, explicitly told that you're not to leave the the confines of the village center, precisely because people are concerned that maybe you the stranger may go start looking for artifacts. Um, so they're pretty vigilant there. And again, um, that looting, I don't think, from outsiders is really much of an issue. Um, I, not that I'm aware of, because of just this remoteness um, and difficulty to get there. Um, and I don't think many people are sailing there also. <laughs> it's a difficult crossing, and the waters are really dangerous. We are one of the most remote areas in Alaska, and the only reach is by aircraft or or a small ship to the mainland. And uh, we are out of the road system, and um, a lot depends on the weather to get supplies for the stores and fuel delivery. And I've often greeted people saying, welcome to Savunga, where everything is weather permitting. <laughs> <laughs> and his trip was delayed. We didn't think he was going to get here because of weather. So, but he made it, thank goodness. Well, thank you. We're so happy that you did make it. And thank you for joining us. And thank you. Thank Ken. you so much for having me down here.